You right? I loved watching episode one of The Last of Us. There was a surprising amount of mental health stuff for us to talk about. So, makes sense. We watch episode two, right? A question for this video. If someone started displaying out of character, impulsive violence, which part or parts of the brain do you think might be implicated? Let me know in the comments below. I will check. Ready? Let's crack on. Microbiologists and pathologists are amazing. Yeah. Ini opio cordyceps. Tapi kenapa menggunakan klorazol untuk mempersiapkan slide? Kami gunakan sebagai persiapan pengambilan sampel dari tubuh manusia, Bu Ratna. I'm a bit rusty from med school, but cordyceps is not even a fungus I've heard of. May have done a little Google search, broken the fourth wall of these analysis videos. The reason I haven't heard from it is because it's not a fungus that usually infects humans. Microbiologists and pathologists are amazing. The fact that a microbiologist can just look down the microscope and identify a specific genus of what fungus it may be like that, to me, it's incredible, and they really do do it that quickly. That's not even an exaggeration for telly. So that's your bite mark. It's an upper layer and a bottom layer of teeth. Apa ini gigitan manusia? I know a tiny tiny weeny bit about forensic odontology for my forensic diploma. So one of the, the first question you've got to ask yourself is, is it a bite mark? If it is, the second question is, what species did it come from? Human? Animal? If it's an animal, what animal? And the third question is, if it's human, you can do some measurements between particular distances between certain teeth marks to try and get a rough estimation of what age the person was that inflicted the bite. Mainly, was it an adult? Was it a child? Human bites have been shown to transmit hepatitis B, hepatitis C, a herpes simplex, tetanus, actinomycosis. I know there are some animal bites that can transmit fungal infections too. On the last episode, I talked briefly about prion diseases such as Kuru that is transmitted by cannibalism. Prions being these abnormally folded proteins that once they're in the brain can cause neurodegeneration usually over weeks to months, causing dementia, involuntary movements, blindness, weakness, coma, and invariably fatal. The more famous examples, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, otherwise not so PC, known as mad cow disease, and a rare human variant called CJD, or kreutzfeldt jakob disease, that I'm probably still butchering the pronunciation of. These prion diseases generally are transmitted by exposure to contaminated brains, such as during a post-mortem, or from contaminated neurosurgical instruments that have come in contact with um, a brain of someone with prion disease. Jadi kapan ini terjadinya, Pak? Kurang lebih 30 jam yang lalu, Bu. Di mana? Di pabrik tepung dan gabah di barat kota. Lahan yang sempurna untuk itu. Lalu Fungi can grow on flour and grain. One famous example is the ergot fungus, which has caused many an outbreak all the way back to medieval times. Ergotism is not contagious in the sense that it's passed from person to person, but you do tend to find that there are clusters of people within the same population or same families, all afflicted by it at the same time because they've ingested the same grains contaminated with that ergot fungus, particularly rye. In some cases of ergot poisoning, people have mainly had this gangrenous form you get this vasoconstriction, this narrowing of the blood vessels, particularly those that supply the distal extremities into your fingers and your toes, cutting off the blood supply as the tissue starts to die off. The other form of ergotism is a convulsive form, so lots of seizures. That causes a clinical picture akin to serotonin syndrome, where toxic levels of serotonin affect our autonomic nervous system, causing a tremor, a bit of a jippy dum tachycardia, so rapid heart rate, blood pressure starts to go up and down. It affects our neuromuscular system, generally causing a stiffness in our muscles, and then affects our central nervous system, causing this agitation and irritability, but eventually it can cause a loss of consciousness and can cause seizures. It was medically used to try and induce labour and to treat migraines because of the vasoconstriction effect, which is an overlapping mechanism to what the triptans do that are commonly used for migraines today, despite, you know, ergot being a bit poisonous, that's the whole problem with it. Safe to say it didn't really work. 
Seorang perempuan yang tiba-tiba melakukan kekerasan menyerang empat orang rekan kerja dan menggigit tiga orang di antaranya. Mereka kemudian mengunci perempuan itu di kamar mandi sampai kemudian polisi datang. Perempuan itu mencoba menyerang dan terpaksa harus ditembak. You start to see how difficult the contact tracing can be because you've got, well, who bit her? Are they still out there? How many people did this person bite? How many people are they going to go on to bite? And you can start to see how the pandemic develops, which is an exponential growth in the number of cases across a wide geographical area, so numerous countries. And when I say exponential, I mean that the number of new cases each day far exceeds the number of new cases in the preceding day. Sudden violence suggests a degree of disinhibition, which means that the frontal lobe is inevitably implicated, specifically a structure called the prefrontal cortex, the psychiatrist's favorite part of the brain, because usually it's not working tip top in most neuropsychiatric conditions. Executive function is this very mature, higher order set of brain functions of attention, concentration, judgment, working memory, planning, impulse control. Without this, we just act on the more impulsive parts of our brain. We act on emotion, we act on rewards, we act on what we want without really any regard for consequences or how we go about achieving our aim. And as I said, executive dysfunction is implicated to some degree in nearly all neuropsychiatric conditions. It's implicated in schizophrenia, in depression, in bipolar, borderline personality disorder, addiction, the list goes on. Saya telah menghabiskan waktu hidup saya untuk mempelajari hal ini. Jadi tolong dengarkan saya baik-baik. Tidak ada obat dan tidak ada vaksin. Jadi apa yang harus kami lakukan? Bom. Mulailah pengoboman. Bom seluruh kota. Dan seluruh orang yang ada di dalamnya. Bom in the city, I suppose it gets the message across that the situation is pretty dire, which is arguably better public health messaging than we had through most of COVID. And the vaccine, that's what this is? We've heard this a million times. Vaccines, miracle cures, none of it works, ever. Man, I didn't ask for this. You and me both. This isn't going to end well, Tess. We need to go back. And if it sounds too good to be true, then it probably is. Most of us humans find tolerating uncertainty to be really difficult. It makes us feel uncomfortable. It makes us feel anxious, the idea that we don't have all the answers, so we don't have a clear and obvious solution. The unknown and the unfamiliar leaves us feeling very, very vulnerable because we can't really sit with that. We're not very good at sitting with it a lot of people become much more suggestible to pseudoscientific, let's face it, quackpot theories that try and feign that we have all the answers. And then we get this confirmation bias where we pay more attention to the evidence that supports our pre-existing belief and we give little regard to evidence that goes against our pre-existing belief. We saw this during COVID, ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine. Sometimes this is, you know, vulnerable people seeking answers, trying to reassure each other, albeit in not a good and not a productive way. Unfortunately, though, there are many a charlatan out there that are looking to make money off of the vulnerability of others. And this is why distinguishing between information and misinformation, particularly for people that don't have much of an academic, specifically scientific background, can actually be really difficult. And it leaves some people very, very vulnerable to this exploitation. Where'd you learn to do that? The circus. Knife crime is associated with higher rates of poor mental health. It's a notorious problem in the UK. We don't have guns, but we do have quite a few knives. Um, a 2021 study found that knife carrying, particularly amongst men in the UK, was associated with an array of social problems, pro-violent attitudes, and higher rates of mental illness, specifically antisocial personality disorder, substance use disorder, paranoia, which can stem from many different conditions. People that carry knives have quite complex psychosocial difficulties that are associated with some of this criminal behavior, which means the approach to address this needs to go beyond simply criminalizing it more and more and more. But doing that for years don't work. Arguably the default needs to be more of a public health response rather than a criminal justice response.
it's uh, the fungus is going everywhere and it's covering his face and his eyes. And there's already a pretty strong evidence base out there that those with visual impairment do have superior abilities in other senses, specifically auditory senses, so hearing stuff, and tactile, so feeling stuff. Question is. Why is that the case? How does it happen? One theory is that this is through cross-modal plasticity, i.e. the areas in the occipital cortex that would usually encode and respond to visual information, instead start encoding and responding to non-visual information. So encodes information through senses like hearing and feeling. It might be that people that are visually impaired have to work extra hard to be able to utilize their other senses, particularly tactile skills, for example, when they're learning to read braille, that that has an effect on synaptic plasticity where those connections involved in that skill become much, much, much stronger and much more proficient. So it might be that it's a more learned behavior with synaptic plasticity in the normal pre-existing pathways rather than this crossing over to new pathways. So it's still good stuff for us to talk about. I'm a little bit nervous about episode three because loads of you have said that it's really intense and really heavy and quite beautifully queer as well so I am going to watch it kind of excited and nervous at the same time let me know what you thought though in the comments below and I will see you for the next episode very very soon love you bye